just hang on to it for, for one more minute before we, we open our letters. You know, friends, I want to suggest to you this morning that your story and my story has a lot in common with the story of this widow and her sons. And that's what I'd like to unpack together with you for the rest of our time here this morning. As you write your name on your letter, I want to, um, I want to tell you something about it. I want to warn you that what's inside, I've got one of these as well. It's addressed to me, my name, Owen Ellis. I want to warn you that this is not a letter of encouragement. It's not one of those warm, fuzzy letters that we like to give out from time to time. But the contents are true, okay? So um, if you're ready, just go ahead and lift that bit of sellotape there and open the first part of your envelope. There's someone else waving their hand who might need a pen or a letter. Can you make sure that everyone's got one? Open the first part of your envelope there. And you will see that this is definitely the sort of letters that you don't really enjoy receiving in the mail. Who can tell me what it says? So you can interact here this morning. Invoice. Invoice statement. And as you open it down a bit further, you see it's addressed to, um, to you, the addressee, and that it's a, for an account that was opened by you at birth. And there's some information, there's some details on this account. And um, these details refer to a number of scriptural references. And friends, just before we start opening our Bibles and, and following through these, and some of them we'll look at it on the screen, and some we'll, we'll go into the Word on our, in our hands. But before we open the Word, can I just ask once more that, that we bow our heads and that we pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you've given us this Word by your Holy Spirit, and as the Holy Spirit impressed the writers, we just pray this morning that you will open our hearts and our minds to the message that you have for us as individuals. And Lord, that you will put Owen aside and just, just speak through me this morning, Lord. May nothing of me stand in the way of your word. This is my prayer in your name. Amen. Let's take a look at your balance brought forward. These texts are mostly pretty familiar ones this morning as we go on. The first entry on your account refers to Romans 5 and verse 12. Friends, this is something that was on our account before we were even born, really. It was just added to our account from the past. And we're told that through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. Thus death spread to all men because all sinned. The first entry on your account comes from someone in the past. This family inherited a debt and we too have inherited a debt. David acknowledged this in Psalms 51 where he, um, where he spoke of the fact that he was born in sin. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin, my mother conceived me, David said. He acknowledged the fact that he was born sinful. Jumping back to the New Testament, Paul says in Romans 3.23, All have sinned and fallen short of the, power of the, fallen short of the glory of God. There's, there's none of us who are without sin. We're jumping back to the Old Testament. These are just a few references here. Ezekiel 18.20, the soul who sins shall die. Another entry on our record for us. It's not looking good. And again, Paul in the first part of Romans 6.23, and we're just going to focus on that for now. The rest is very good, but I just want to focus on the first part of 6.23, where Paul says, the wages of sin is death. It's a pretty consistent picture throughout Scripture. It's a pretty consistent picture on our record here. And you know, often what we do is when we load up our statement with debits, we want to start to earn some credits. We want to do something to deal with this problem. And so one way to do this is to try really hard to be good, right? And we try and earn some credits. 
We try and do some good deeds. But Isaiah has something to say about that. Isaiah 64 verse 6, and it's not really very encouraging either because he says, we are all like an unclean thing. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So we try and earn some credits, but it actually counts as debits on our records because Isaiah says, if I, in my own strength, go out and try and do good things to try and put credits back on my account to try and save my life, it's worth nothing to me. All my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And you know, it's hard to argue with what the balance owing is your life. And the fact is that the debt collector does come and he knocks on the door and he wishes to collect his debt. I want you to open your Bibles with me to Zechariah chapter 3 because here we find a picture of the debt collector. Zechariah chapter 3. This debt collector is very committed to his work. This debt collector takes it seriously. And starting in Zechariah 3 verse 1, we read the following. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him or to accuse him. The accuser is the debt collector. And what is his name? Satan. This is a judgment scene. Who is the one who is accusing Joshua? Not God, it's Satan. And so we have this, this picture here. And now God speaks to Satan in verse 2. And he says, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Satan is there and he's doing his very best to condemn us. He points to our filthy garments, our defective characters. He presents our weaknesses and folly, our sins of ingratitude, our unlikenesses to Christ, which have dishonored our Redeemer. All this he urges as an argument, proving his right to work his will in our destruction. He endeavors to affright our souls with the thought that our case is hopeless that the stain of our defilement can never be washed away. He hopes so to destroy our faith that we will yield fully to his temptations and turn from our allegiance to God. But notice, what does God say to Satan as he is doing his work of accusing? He turns and he says, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Isn't this... Isn't this someone who I have rescued? Isn't this a brand plucked from the fire? And as we read on the next couple of verses in, in Zechariah chapter 3, we see that Joshua is clothed there with filthy garments. And then the words are spoken in verse 4, Take away the filthy garments from him. And he said, See, I have removed your iniquity or your sin from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And then they also put a clean turban on his head as well. What happens to Joshua's filthy rags? What happens to them in this picture? When the accuser is saying that they are the reason why he should die, what does God command to be done with them? He says, take them off. Take the filthy rags away from him, and give him what? Give him clean robes. And so now Joshua, who represents you and me, friends, Joshua stands there in clean robes, representing Christ's righteousness, and he is clean before God in the judgment. And that's good news for Joshua. But let's think for a moment about those filthy rags that are sitting there on the floor that have just been removed from Joshua. Because the accuser knows his Bible and the accuser knows the word that says the wages of sin is death. But there are the sins 
lying there in a pile on the floor and nobody has died. And God responds in the following way and we find it in Isaiah chapter 53 and I call this the gospel of the Old Testament. And turn there with me if you will, Isaiah chapter 53 and we'll just look at verses 4 through 6 because this tells us what has happened with those filthy rags that get removed from Joshua. Speaking of Christ, Isaiah said, Surely he has borne our sins and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought our peace was upon him. By his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to our own way, but the Lord has laid on him, on Christ that is, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So those filthy garments, as it were, were picked up from the floor and they had to go somewhere because the wages of sin was death and God placed it on his own son, Jesus Christ. Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter 2.24. He says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we, having died to sins, might live to righteousness. By his stripes we are healed. Jesus Christ paid the debt. He took our sins in himself. You know, friends, when the debt collector comes knocking on your door and reminding you that the debt is due, remind him that the debt has been paid already. 1 John 1.7 tells us this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom... I am chief. Sorry, 1 Timothy 1.15. You know, Paul did not deny his sinfulness. He said, I'm the chief of sinners, but Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And John reminds us that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So there we have the accuser. Let's come back to our story and see what parallels we can find as we go through. If you, if you open up your, um, your statement, if you haven't done so already, we've got an outline there of some points from the story. And if you like, you can note how this parallels with your story and mine as we, as we go through our last few minutes here this morning. First of all, we note that the widow and her sons had inherited a debt that they could not repay. And if we look at our invoice, we can see that we too have inherited a debt that we are not able to repay. Secondly, we notice that the debt collector harassed them and he actually claimed their lives in payment for the debt. He wanted the lives of the sons to pay for this debt. And in Zechariah 3, We've seen how the accuser comes and he actually wants to claim our lives. That widow was totally incapable of paying back her own debt. She had no way that she could earn that money. She could have begged for time. There was no way that she could have, not even in the lifetime of her sons if they worked, could have they repaid the debt. It was so big. If they could have, I think the debt collectors would have waited, but they were just going to get whatever they could and that would do. And you know, we too are incapable of paying our debt. We have nothing to recommend us to God. The plea that we may now urge and ever is our utterly helpless condition, which makes his redeeming power a necessity. Renouncing all self-dependence, we may look to the cross of Calvary and say, in my hand no price I bring, simply to the cross I cling. I cannot do anything to pay the debt of sin that I owe. I notice in the story that all she had 
was a small jug. I like to imagine that it had been given to her as a gift and also that it obviously was not of any value to anyone else, otherwise the debt collectors would have taken it already. Friends, we each have something small that we have been given. Paul speaks of it in Romans 12 verse 3, where he says, we have each been given the measure of faith. We each get given an equal measure of faith with which we can then act upon. We can choose what we do with it. It is a gift. Paul emphasizes this again in Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 where he says, By grace you have been saved through faith. Through faith, and and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. We have this small gift. Now what this widow was asked to do with the gift did not make sense. Well, it didn't make sense to others. And friends, Scripture acknowledges that to others, the gospel does not really make sense. Paul puts it this way. He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's 1 Corinthians 1.18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It doesn't really make sense in logical terms. To others, to those, to us, unless the Spirit of God opens it to our minds and helps us to accept it and understand. But it's the power of God to those who are being saved. You know, when that woman went home that day, And all she had in her kitchen was a whole stack of empty pots and her little jar of oil. This was time for exercising that faith. She'd begun to exercise it by collecting the empty jars and now she had to lift her little oil and begin to pour it. But friends, I want you to notice that her faith did not make the oil flow. Her faith did not make the oil flow. What made the oil to flow? Only God. Her faith allowed God to make the oil flow. Her faith permitted God to make the oil flow. And friends, it's the same for us. My faith cannot save me. But when I act in faith, when in faith I reach out and accept what God has done for me, that allows Him to save me, because it's all Him and none of me. But in a sense, I do have a part to play. In the same way as that lady, if she had not lifted that jug and begun to pour, God could not have caused the oil to flow. And unless we cooperate with God, surrendering our lives to Him, accepting what He has done for us, He cannot save us. But then he gives us that faith so that we can choose, so we can accept what he has done for us. Friends, we don't have to have great faith. We just have to trust a faithful God. We don't have to have great faith. We only have to trust a faithful God. There was sufficient oil there to pay not only her debt, but also to provide for the future. You know, I think that's marvelous. Her problem at the time was just that she had this huge debt. And God could have provided just enough oil to pay the debt, but he provided enough also for their future. And you know, when Jesus Christ died, he paid the debt for my past. And now as he lives again, he provides for my future by clothing me in his own robe of righteousness. I think of it in this way, friends. If you owed a million dollars, if that was all you had was a million dollar debt, 
and I can't do this for you, but imagine that I could come and pay off your debt, what then do you have? What is the value in your bank account? I pay your exact debt. What is the value in your account? Zero. Friends, there's no salvation for zeros. We don't only need our debt paid off, but we need righteousness in order to inherit eternal life. And so Christ not only paid my debt, but he lives today to give me his robe of righteousness so that I can have eternal life. He doesn't only care for my past, he provides for my future. What a great God. What a great God. I have one more parallel this morning. And that is, as you see, the oil flowed freely that day in order to pay the debt. But something else, something way more valuable than oil flowed to pay your debt and mine. It was Christ's blood that flowed freely. There was no other way the debt could be paid. In Hebrews 9.22, we read that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or no forgiveness or no wiping out of sin. And John tells us that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. And so it was his blood that flowed freely that day on Calvary to pay your debt and mine. Now, friends, in your hand you have an invoice, a statement. And I really don't want to send you away with an account that's overdue. Because I don't really like seeing accounts come in the mail that haven't already been paid. And I have with me here some paid stamps. I love it when you go into the office, you know, we hardly ever do this kind of thing these days. We do all do it over the internet. But you, know, you go and you pay your rates and, and they put a paid stamp right there. And you go, that's just what we want to see. It's taken care of. That bill has been paid. And I have some stamps here that I, that I want to pass around. And I want to encourage you as these come around to stamp paid on your invoice. I don't know you each. And perhaps there's someone here who's never quite before said, Jesus Christ, I accept your payment for my account. If that's you, I'd encourage you to stamp paid right there as you talk to him and as you accept what he's done for you. Or perhaps you're, you're like me and you've accepted Christ a long time ago. And you think, well, I, I know, Owen, it's okay. I, I know what he's done for me. But you know, the Apostle Paul said, I die daily. And Jesus Christ said, if anyone would come after me, Luke 9, 23, he must take up his cross daily. He must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. To take up our cross is to take up a symbol of our death to self and our acceptance that Jesus Christ has in fact died for us. You know, friends, we need to daily accept the gift of salvation. We need to daily acknowledge that we are totally incapable of paying this debt on our own, and we are also totally incapable of living a righteous life on our own. We need to daily lay aside self and allow him to work in us. And we need to daily affirm by faith that the price has been paid. So I'm going to pass these stamps back and I'd encourage you to just affirm, yes, Jesus Christ, I know you've paid the debt for me. And as I pass these round, I'm just going to ask Trevor to play a short song for us as we stamp our, our statements this morning.
Andre Crouch penned the words, the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, will never lose its power. We've just sung earlier this morning the words of William Cowper, who wrote, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. You know, friends, that's not really, when taken literally, it's not a nice picture. But when we understand those words through the light of the gospel, there is no more wonderful picture. And Lewis Jones wrote, Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. And I'd invite you to stand with me this morning as we conclude our time together by singing Lewis's hymn, Power in the Blood. Let's join together. Let's pray. There is power, power, wonder-working power, and the precious blood of the Lamb. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for Jesus Christ. Jesus, we thank you for what you gave for us. Taking my sins upon yourself, paying the full penalty on my behalf. Lord, may we accept that by faith today. May we accept you by faith into our lives to transform us and make us new and to continue working on us and living with us each day. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he turn his countenance towards you and give you peace. Amen.